thank you, thank you. Yeah, my name's Austin. Uh, I work with an organization called Chief, um, where our mission is to uh, bring more women into positions of power. Um, and we do that through executive leaders have a private network to sort of connect um, and attend events. And they have these fun clubhouses throughout the country to just kind of facilitate that, those connections. Um, so for today's adventure, um, we're gonna be talking a lot about fragments. Um, and so we'll start out kind of recapping why we use GraphQL in the first place, just aligning. I'm, I'm sure we've talked about a, that a lot this weekend. Um, then we'll spend most of the day uh, talking about fragments. We'll touch on composition towards the end, and then we'll do a live demo. Um, so yeah, why do we use GraphQL and why was GraphQL invented? Um, if we take it all the way back to React Europe back in 2015 when Nick Schrock and Lee Byron introduced it, um, their sort of mission was to build the ideal API for front-end developers. Um, and so what did this look like? Um, there was a single endpoint to serve all of our clients that came with a strongly typed API contract. We had a, um, this new, this ability to reduce the number of round trips to our server. And then we had this rich ecosystem of tooling such as Apollo Client, some of the code gen tools, uh, self-documentation, and all of that fun stuff. But today, I really wanna hone in on this idea of declarative field selection um, and how that ties to avoiding overfetching and underfetching data, and then how that ties into fragments. Um, the motivation for this talk today was at our organization, I felt like we weren't using fragments effectively, and I kind of felt like it was an isolated problem that we were experiencing. But Dan sort of publicized this and said, if you're not composing um, GraphQL fragments from multiple components into a single query, I think you're missing 80% of the point of GraphQL. And then that kind of made me have a light bulb moment that maybe other organizations are also struggling with this. Um, and maybe it's a more common problem than I expected. Uh, so what are fragments? Fragments are very similar to what we see with queries, mutations, and subscriptions. We just define this keyword fragment. We give it a name and then a type condition. So on user, on product, on any of our GraphQL types. Now, often our first inclinations with this is we've always been taught dry programming, don't repeat yourself. Um, so a lot of times when the sort of tendency our team fell into was defining fragments around these generic types. So we would you know, name a fragment user fields and then every possible field that could be queried on a user would fall under this fragment. And over time, as different pages have different data dependencies, this starts to balloon, and you know we might grab a list of friends for one page. Uh, we might need to know if a user has an active subscription to see another part of our application. Um, and this just starts to bubble over time, and now we're requesting data on different pages that are not relevant to that piece of UI. If we sort of look into the future and look at a real-world example um, that our team experienced, uh, this is our self-query, so it's just data about the currently authenticated user. Um, and you can see it's seemingly innocent, and we're actually making use of fragments, but once again, I think it's sort of in that, uh, not in the correct manner. Um, this self-query is tied into this use self hook, which is used in about 73, app 73 places in our application. Um, and it, once again, it's seemingly innocent, but if we sort of expand these fragments and look at the contents, we'll notice our selection set is over 100 fields, um, and this is not fully inclusive. And so for you know, just showing a login screen to know should we show like username input and email or password input, we're, qu we're querying all of these fields here, um, which makes that login screen very slow to load. So what's the big problem here? Um, what kind of issues might we run into? What happens if we wanna add a field? Now we're gonna add that data dependency to the loading of every single page that leverages that fragment we previously looked at. What happens if we wanna remove a field? How do we know the downstream impacts of components that might have been reliant on that field? Often we're kind of using these generic code gen definitions that point out a specific type rather than using the explicit needs of our individual components. What happens if we remove an entire component from our UI? How do we know to remove those associated data dependencies? It's, off, it's probably gonna be the case that we just leave those around and we're now overfetching data 
And we're kind of missing out on one of those core GraphQL promises. So can we do better? Is there, is there a better way to leverage fragments? So in that same React Europe conference, Lee, he takes the time to acknowledge that sure, fragments can be used to not have to redefine fields. But the more important part is that fragments allow for a UI component to describe exactly the data it needs. I think another great way to put this is uh, Jordan Eldridge. He has this GraphQL maturity model. Um, and in point eight, he notes this. Each of your UI components defines its own data dependencies using a GraphQL fragment. Queries are composed of these fragments. And this enables components to add or remove data locally without having to worry about breaking anyone else. So we can take a look at a really trivial example. Here we have a profile card, we might call it, so a profile card component where we see a name, job title, and then we have an avatar. So if we think about the data dependencies of this individual component, we might write a fragment similar to the following. Fragment profile card, that's the component. On user, we need these fields from a user, and we need the name, job title, and avatar URL. Oops. Um, so in the past, where we might have defined our entire selection set with the root query, instead of doing that, we can now use composition to just spread the data dependencies of a profile card into that root level query. And now, if that profile card is used on multiple different pages, we can just bubble up those fragments to any query that um, needs that data. So let's jump into a demo. Glad I got this working. Okay, sweet. So our example is super simple. We sort of have a food ordering app of sorts. Um, we just show the restaurant name, we show the list of menu items and a little bit of details about them. Maybe the, the name of the item, a short description, the price, and a thumbnail image. If we click into one of the individual cards, we'll see that same um, item card being reused. And then we have a new little nutrition facts bar for this individual item page. If we take a look at the code, it's, it's super simple. We have a server and then a React app. The server's just a simple Apollo server. We have a schema where we just have two queries. We have item by ID. Um, let me zoom in, this font is pretty small. So we have the item by, is that, is that good for everyone? Sweet. A little more? Cheers. Let's. <laughs> That's fair. Is that good? OK, sweet. So yeah, we have two queries. We have item by ID and restaurant by ID. And then we have three types here. We have a restaurant type, an item type, and then a nutrition facts type. So relatively lightweight. Um, and then we just have a fake database that just kind of generates some, some fake data. So, so nothing fancy. Um, and then if we take a look at our client application, it's, it's also pretty lightweight. We have a restaurant menu page, and we have an item by ID page. If we took a look at the restaurant menu page, it's pretty familiar. We're just taking the restaurant ID from the URL, we're passing that to our use query hook, and then we're just rendering some UI. You'll notice there on line 20, um, we're kind of mapping through all the individual items and rendering this item card. Then if we take a look at the item by ID page, very, very similar. We grab the item ID from the URL, we pass that to the use query hook, and then very similar, we render some UI down below, and then we're also leveraging that same item card component, as you'll notice. So now, if we take a look at the, our item card, it's just a little bit of UI, and the nutrition facts card is very similar. And this is the pattern that our organization was using that we kind of talked about a little bit earlier, where we just have a sort of generic fragment that's based around our GraphQL types rather than our components. So what's kind of the problem here? We, we spread this fragment here um, into our restaurant by ID query and our item by ID query. And if we take a look at our restaurant page, nowhere on here do we show anything about the nutrition facts. So that core promise of not overfetching data, 
we've just fallen kind of into that pit and lost that um, supposed benefit. So how can we improve this? We're gonna break down these fragments and these queries to co-locate those with the components that require that data. Um, and then we're gonna compose those up into root queries. Let's get started. Um, so if we take a look at the item card component, our sort of self-defined prop types kind of tell us what we need already. Um, but instead of doing that there, let's just, let's define a fragment down below. So this pattern's relatively arbitrary, but um, it's a very common pattern out uh, that other teams use. But I just attach a property to our item card to the component name, and then whatever the type is, provide that there, so item. And then we use our GQL syntax, give our fragment a name, that type condition, and then now we define the fields that are relevant to this specific component. So item, name, price, description, and thumbnail. Sweet. So now if we go ahead and run CodeGen, Um, we have an error. It's hard to read it. So what's our error? Unknown type user. Uh, that should be on item. My apologies. Now if we run code gen again, uh, our GraphQL generated types have been updated. And now rather than manually defining these prop definitions, we're going to get a type that's precisely what we see here. So we can go item card fragment, import that from our generated types, and we'll see, it's a little bit harder to read here, but that type definition is exactly what our prop types were, but now we get these automatically inferred from our fragment definitions at the component level. Now how do we compose these into root level queries? Well, if we take a look at our items page, we were using that sort of centralized query. Instead of doing that, let's do a very similar pattern. Item by ID page, query, um, and then now we give our query a name, a little bit repetitive, my apologies. Um, and then, okay, so we have this query. What are we querying? This is the item page, so item by ID. We'll provide an ID here. I forget if I gave this a um, ID type or a string type, my apologies. It's an ID suite. Um, so we grab item by ID, and now rather than, as we touched on earlier, rather than defining these data dependencies in the query, we just pass our fragment here. So let's go down here and import it. Um, so it's coming from our item card component, right, which we've already imported, and then we can just go item card, fragments, item. And then now we can leverage that here and just spread it. So now we have item card, and now if we save this, and we go take a look at the individual item card page. Uh, whoops, we didn't update this. Item by ID page dot query. Now if we take a look, boom, our ID is, our, our UI has updated. Um, you might notice our nutrition facts have kind of disappeared. That's just because we haven't composed those data dependencies up into the query. So let's quickly break down the nutrition cards. Um, nutrition facts card component. It's a tongue twister. Um, so same thing, uh, nutrition facts card fragments, uh, nutrition facts. Once again, this is all very arbitrary and your team can use whatever patterns work for you, but um, this is just what's worked for us. So we'll grab the, we'll call it the same name as a component. A lot of times you might see underscore and then the type and that's actually a, best, a better practice, but just to avoid confusion, um, we're just gonna keep going this route. Okay, sweet. So we're gonna define a selection set on the nutrition facts type, and what do we want? We want the calories, maybe the sugar content. Um, I forget what those other two were. Protein and carbs. Okay, sweet. And now if we go back to our item by ID page, we can now do the same, same sort of thing. We grab our nutrition facts, and then we'll just spread the nutrition facts card here, and then once again, um, pass it here. 
So now if we go back, no fragment name nutrition facts card. Oh, I missed the S. Um, so now if we refresh the page, amazing. We have our, um, our nutrition facts card back. And so now we have our data dependencies defined at the component level. And we can do this, the same thing for the restaurant page. So if we go to our menu page or our restaurant menu page, um, let's just do this really quickly to kind of illustrate the point. I know it's a little repetitive, um, but if we do this, and we can even kind of copy most of the um, functionality just from here. So if we just grab our query. Now, rather than spreading this item fields fragment that's just very generic and not specific to this component, um, instead of doing that, once again, we leverage the item card so we can just pass the item card. Um, dependencies. Okay, sweet. So if we go back to our restaurant page, um, that's completely functional. Now we can just go ahead and, oops, actually I forgot to do this again. Sweet. So now if we go ahead and just delete the GraphQL file, everything's functioning as expected. There's no issues. And now all of our data dependencies are defined at the component level. So what kind of power does this bring? Now the, the nice thing is, say in our item card, we no longer want to show this long description and we want to make it a smaller um, component. We can just delete this. And then the data dependency is right there. So we just remember to remove it from there. Then we can run code gen and um, get all of our types updated. But that's sort of the idea. Let's jump back into our presentation. Um, so this is basically the same slide we visited earlier. Um, but what, what's the big benefit of doing things this way? What if we want to add a field? Now that fragment selection set is defined with our component. We just go in there, we add the field we need. Um, and then anywhere that component's used, the queries are automatically gonna query all those new fields. We don't have to go to each individual query and update those queries with the new selection set fields. What if we wanna remove a field? Since our fragment is local to our component, we no longer have to worry about downstream impacts. We know we can remove that field and be safe without affecting the rest of our application. What if we remove a component? Earlier where we probably would have just forgot our data dependencies, left them there, and probably degraded the user's experience. Now as we remove a component, the data dependencies are defined right there, so we can automatically delete those data dependencies. We're gonna get TypeScript errors to go update our queries, and then we can be assured that we're not overfetching data. So there's still a little bit of room to be desired to give us a little bit more power with this uh, pattern, but there's a lot, a lot of cool stuff coming to Apollo Client with 3.8 and 3.9 with this new use fragment hook um, that can even bring more power for, for things such as not re-rendering um, individual components because status quo, uh, even though we define these fragments at the component level, if a query changes, our whole component tree is still gonna re-render. A nice next step would to be to avoid that and only re-render um, components that are associated with the fragment that updated. Another tool that's really nice that I just kind of want to point out is this GraphQL Tools uh, Relay op Operation Optimizer. So the TLDR, is, it reduces query size through some fun stuff. And then the important part in kind of relation with today's talk is that it allows us to define arguments at the fragment level. Um, which previously would have, we would have had to define all of our fragments with our queries, which kind of breaks some of these benefits. So if we have one takeaway from today's talk, I'd love for it to be this. Each of your UI components defines its own data dependencies using a fragment, and queries are composed from these fragments. Thank you.